So good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get uh, started here with uh, this morning's uh, webinar. I'm joined by uh, several pan panelists you see up above, and I'll introduce everyone here in just a moment. Um, this morning, uh, we'll be talking about hurricanes, hurricane forecasting, uh, and the hazards associated with hurricanes. And we'll spend about uh, half an hour uh, with the presentation. Uh, but during that time, we're gonna allow you to ask questions. There's a question box on your panel. Uh, and um, I see someone's asking about hearing audio. Uh, you should hear it now. Hopefully everyone uh, is. Uh, you may have to uh, allow access uh, uh, via your computer to your uh, speakers and, and microphone or also can use the phone line. Uh, but we will uh, have time for questions and answers. We will be uh, fielding questions that you type in from the question box. Uh, we'll actually answer some of those during uh, the webinar, but we'll save some of the really great questions uh, for the panelists and we'll be uh, asking those and hopefully have plenty of time for your questions. Um, well, we'll go ahead and get started and I'll ask, I think John might have control right now and I'll see if he can well, Robbie does, and we'll, we'll uh, say first, uh, uh, before I introduce the panelists, we'll kind of introduce you to some of the, the hurricanes that have affected uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama, the areas that you all are from. And uh, unfortunately, this area is no stranger to hurricanes. Uh, we've seen a lot of hurricanes affect uh, this region through the years. Uh, go all the way back to 1969 in Camille. It was a Category 5 hurricane that made landfall along the northern uh, Gulf Coast. And then uh, we've had other storms like uh, Frederick uh, that uh, also impacted the area. And then more recently, some storms that you or your parents may remember, uh, Ivan back in 2004. And then we had uh, uh, Katrina and Rita back in the 2005 uh, hurricane season and Harvey uh, more recently. All these storms have brought lots of strong winds, heavy rainfall and storm surge to these areas. And we're gonna be talking about those hazards here this morning. So let me next introduce all the panelists that you see, and hopefully you can see all of us uh, uh, up on uh, your screen. And uh, this morning I'm joined uh, uh, first by uh, Robbie Berg. Uh, Robbie's the hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center. As you can see, we're all broadcasting today from our, our homes, uh, much like your parents, we are uh, at home uh, this time of year. We do have a unit at the Hurricane Center that is doing operational forecasting right now. They do a lot of marine forecasting year round. Some of those folks are even working for home uh, right now. But Robbie, I'll let you say uh, good morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, this morning in our webinar. And uh, I'll be talking first up here after we introduce ourselves uh, about hurricanes and about meteorologists and what we do in our jobs. Yep, and again, uh, I'm uh, Dan Brown, uh, you see my picture there, and uh, I am also a hurricane special at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, next, I'll introduce uh, John Cangelosi. John is also a hurricane special at the Hurricane Center. John? Hey, hey, good morning, everybody. Hopefully, you're excited to learn about hurricanes today. Uh, I'll be answering some questions in the question box, so don't be shy, and maybe at the end, we'll answer your questions live with the whole panel. So, hopefully, you enjoyed the webinar. And then I'll also introduce Andy from the Hurricane Center. Uh, Andy uh, is gonna help uh, give part of the presentation this morning. So uh, thanks, Andy. Oh, you might be on mute, Andy. Good morning, Keep everybody. I'll be talking on the second half of the discussion today, talking about some hurricane hazards and how we forecast hurricanes. So thanks, Andy. And then we have uh, two special guests this morning. Uh, one is Danielle Manning. Danielle is uh, from the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Slidell uh, covers in New Orleans, Southeast Louisiana. Uh, Danielle was out busy yesterday doing, uh, unfortunately, a storm survey from some of the tornadoes we had uh, this past Sunday, uh, but she is able to join us this morning. So uh, thanks, uh, Danielle. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll be talking to you a little bit about what our local offices do and how we work with the Hurricane Center to make sure that uh, the best information gets to you guys out in the uh, public. Thanks, Danielle. And uh, the last person I'll introduce this morning is uh, Jeremy DeHart. Uh, Jeremy is a, uh, a flight meteorologist with the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron. Uh, they actually, are, uh, he's one of the folks that fly into hurricanes. Uh, uh, he's stationed in Biloxi, Mississippi, so right in the area that we're talking to this morning. Uh, so you're going to join us, I know, and talk a little bit about uh, what you do, and then you'll be around for the questions as well. So uh, good morning, uh, Jeremy. That's right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'll be talking to you some about weather reconnaissance and actually flying into the hurricane. So I uh, look forward to your questions. 
Okay, thanks. And I can see a few questions are already starting to come in. So we thank you for that. And I'm going to turn it over now so we can uh, begin our presentation. Okay, uh, thanks, Dan. So, you know, we want to start off this morning by talking about what is a meteorologist? We all talked about how that's what our job is, is we're all meteorologists. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can think about this question, what would your answer be? And you can either say it out loud, you can type it in the question box. What is it that you think a meteorologist does on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, actually, it's someone who studies or forecasts the weather. So you see on the pictures here is that most people think about meteorologists as being those people you see on TV. They're telling you what's, what to expect with the weather the next day. Should you bring your umbrella with you? If it's going to rain, is it going to be sunny? And that is true. A lot of those people on TV are meteorologists because they forecast the weather. But there are a lot of people who are also meteorologists and they're not on TV. And most of us, that's kind of what our role is. We, we study the weather, we forecast the weather, especially when it comes to hurricanes. Uh, or in Jeremy's case, he flies airplanes into hurricanes, and, but he's still a meteorologist. So uh, we have many different kinds of jobs that we do in the weather uh, area, uh, but it doesn't always involve being on TV. And these are just some pictures you can see of some of the jobs and roles that we have uh, when we are studying the weather. So as Dan said that many of us that are on this panel are meteorologists at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, we are located in Miami, Florida. You can see there on the map of Miami is in, in South Florida. And what you're all seeing on this slide here are pictures of the National Hurricane Center. So we actually are in this big concrete building. Uh, it's supposed to protect us from the wind because sometimes South Florida can get hit by hurricanes and other severe weather. And so we want to be protected if we still have to work during those storms. And this building with those big concrete walls does protect us from those winds. At the Hurricane Center, we forecast for hurricanes that are occur over the Atlantic Ocean and also over the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. So we have a large area that we're watching when these hurricanes form. And then we try to predict and tell you where we think that these storms are going to go and then how strong we think they could get as well. Now, in addition to hurricanes, we have some other duties as well. We have a, a group of people at the Hurricane Center that are doing forecasts all year round, even when it's not hurricane season. And what they're doing is they're telling boaters, big ships, and other people who spend time out in the ocean what the weather will be like if they're going to be out there. So you can see here some pictures of some of the cruise ships, a yacht, there's even an oil rig there. So for people that work out on the ocean, or are doing fun things out in the ocean, if they're just boating, we have to tell people what kind of weather to expect and also what will the waves be like if they're a boat on the water because you don't really wanna be in an area where there's big waves because that's just not really a fun day. Uh, so not, not only do we do hurricanes, but we also do these forecasts for what the ocean conditions will be like as well. Now, the National Hurricane Center is part of the National Weather Service. You've probably heard of the National Weather Service. It's a part of the federal government. And the question is, where is the National Weather Service? Because like we said, the Hurricane Center is in Miami. Well, the Weather Service is actually everywhere. So everywhere where you guys live, there is a local National Weather Service office that forecasts the weather in your neighborhood. And that's the type of office that Danielle works with or works at. So I'm gonna pass it over to her real quick so that she can talk about the office where she works down in Slidell. So, okay, so our office is uh, located in Slidell, Louisiana. And um, so we're just outside of New Orleans, but we are responsible for forecasting for all of Southeast Louisiana, as well as extreme Southwest and coastal Mississippi. So you can kind of see um, in that map on the bottom right, uh, the area that we're resp responsible for. And uh, not only do we issue the forecasts for that area, we're also responsible for issuing the warnings. So if you live in, a, in my forecast area and you got a tornado warning over the weekend, that came straight from our office. Um, one of the other things that we do is uh, we coordinate with the Hurricane Center during um, tropical weather events so that, again, we can make sure that the big picture forecast that the Hurricane Center issues gets scaled down and we can translate that into local impacts so that you know what to expect in your neighborhood. Um, the other, another thing that we do uh, in order to support um, 
hurricane operations is that we launch weather balloons. We launch those balloons twice a day during normal uh, during normal times, but sometimes we'll even issue them four or launch them four times a day during tropical situations. And uh, the purpose of launching those balloons is to help tell the models what the atmosphere looks like currently, so that the models can try to give us a starting point for the forecast moving forward. So that's kind of what we do here at the uh, local office in Southeast Louisiana. Okay, thanks, Danielle. So let's jump right into talking a little bit more about hurricanes themselves. And what you see on your screen now is an animation or a, a moving picture of a particular hurricane. In fact, this was Hurricane Harvey that hit the coast of Texas a couple of years ago uh, in the Corpus Christi area. Now, what you probably notice on the screen is that there's a part of the hurricane that almost looks like it's clear. This is a satellite picture. So there's a, a satellite that's over the earth, it's rotating with the earth way up high above land, and it's taking pictures down at the surface of the earth. And it's taking pictures essentially of the clouds in this hurricane. And you'll notice that you can see the clouds moving, but there's a part here in the clouds where it doesn't look like that there's really much weather. And that's what we call the eye of the hurricane within the eye, it's usually very calm. So in some parts of the hurricane, such as these clouds you see around the eye, it can be very windy, very heavy rains. But when you get within the eye itself, it's actually quite calm. The winds aren't blowing very hard, if at all, and there's really no rain. And as you'll see with Jeremy when he talks a little bit later, is that the Hurricane Hunter aircraft that we have, they fly through the bad weather in the eye wall, and then when they get in, out into the eye, it's clear, sometimes blue skies up ahead of them. Um, you'll get to see a picture of that here in a second as we move further into the slideshow. So that's what a, a really strong hurricane looks like just before it's ready to make landfall along the coast of the United States. Now you've probably heard that we often group hurricanes into different what we call categories. Sometimes you may hear, hear us say, oh, it's a category three hurricane or a category five hurricane. Well, what are these categories? So several years ago, in fact, many years ago, there were two men named Herb Saffer and Robert Simpson. Uh, one was an engineer and the other one was a meteorologist. And what they did is they got together and they studied past hurricanes and the type of damage that those hurricanes caused. And based on what they saw, they grouped hurricanes into five different categories, which they equated with the wind speeds that those hurricanes produced. And you can see on your screen here, that a category one hurricane has winds of 74 to 95 miles per hour, and that's where we expect some wind damage, all the way up to a category five hurricane where the winds are 157 miles per hour or greater, and at that point is when we expect catastrophic damage. So we use this Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale to help us tell people how strong the winds are in a hurricane. But as we'll see here in a little bit when we talk about the hazards with hurricanes, it's not just the winds that we have to be worried about. This scale, these categories only tell you how strong the hurricane is. They don't tell you how much rain you might get or how much storm surge you get, might get. And we're gonna get into that a little bit more here with Andy as we move on a little bit more into the presentation. So one of the things that we talk about with grouping these hurricanes is major hurricanes. Now, a major hurricane is when we look at category three, four, or five on the Saffir Simpson scale. So what you're looking at here now is a map of the Atlantic Ocean in the United States and the Caribbean, and it's showing you all the areas where major hurricanes have existed, or where they moved, and those are shown by the yellow lines. So when you're looking at this map, what stands out right here? Well, it's probably that when you look at the Gulf of Mexico here and the eastern coast of the United States, Almost every state from Texas to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and even up the East Coast into the Carolinas and near New England, there are some yellow lines. That means that almost all these areas are vulnerable to major hurricanes. A major hurricane can hit any of these coastal states within the United States. Also down here in the Caribbean, a lot of our friends down in some of the islands, they also have to be concerned about these very strong hurricanes that produce major hurricane force winds. Uh, and that's not good because when a major hurricane hits, uh, it can cause a lot of damage because of the strong winds and in addition to the heavy rainfall and storm surge. So really what we're showing you here on this slide is that all areas in our region 
can be hit by these major hurricanes. Well, we wanted to zoom in a little bit closer to your area so you could see what your vulnerability would be to hurricanes as well. So let's go state by state and take a look. What you're seeing here is a map of Louisiana, and all of those lines are hurricanes that have moved through the state of Louisiana since the year 1900. So what you're probably noticing is, wow, every part of the coastline of Louisiana has been hit by a hurricane. All of those lines are pretty much covering most of the southern part of the state. But what you'll probably also notice is that even if the southern part of the state gets hit by a hurricane, a lot of those tracks also move into the northern part of the state as well. So really, anybody in the state of Louisiana can be affected by a hurricane. But let's move on to Mississippi, to the east. Well, it looks like the same thing. The coast of Mississippi, even though it's a little bit shorter, the cities there, Gulfport, Biloxi, they've all been hit by hurricanes since 1900. And many of those hurricanes have traveled north through the state past cities like Hattiesburg and near Jackson. Uh, so all the state of Mississippi has to be on guard for these hurricanes. Lastly, we can take a look, of, look at Alabama. And again, even though the coastline of Alabama is not that long, you can see that the coast has still been hit by lots of hurricanes. The Mobile area in particular, and Mobile Bay, is very susceptible to hurricanes and their hazards. One thing you'll notice about Alabama is that many storms hit the pan Florida panhandle, and they move across Florida and then reach Alabama. So the storm itself doesn't actually have to make landfall in Alabama for other people in Alabama to see the effects of hurricanes. They can come from other places as well. So again, with these three states, we know that you guys unfortunately can get a hurricane almost any year. We have to be ready for that and be prepared for hurricane season. So speaking of hurricane season, let's do a quick quiz. So here's a question that we have. And we're going to ask this question, and then Dan is going to open up a poll, which is going to allow, allow you to actually vote on your answer. So here's the question. When is Atlantic hurricane season? Is it A, May through November, B, December through April, C, June through November, or D, all year long? So Dan, I'll pass it over to you to open up the poll. Sure. Thanks, Robbie. I just opened up the poll. Folks should be able to vote now. I can see a lot of folks are voting. Looks like about half of the folks watching have voted now. Give it a few more minutes, or no, a few more seconds, I should say. Looks like about 80% of everybody out there has voted, so I'm gonna close the poll in just a second. Okay, let me see if I can share the results. And uh, it looks like uh, the most folks, uh, about 70% said uh, June through November, and then another 20% said May through November. So I'll let you provide them the answer. Sure, thanks. So, wow, you guys did a great job. So the right answer is, let's show it now, June through November. So looks like the most of you guys got that answer correct. So we officially say that the hurricane season begins on June 1st and it ends on November 30th. So that is the correct answer. Now, some of you that said May through November aren't too wrong because actually sometimes we can get storms, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, that form in the month of May. So even though the official start is June 1st, it's not uncommon for us to sometimes see storms form in May. So even you guys that picked that answer, you're not too far off. We always have to be ready for storms even just before June 1st. So when we look at the season of a, as a whole, we want you to notice when do we see the most hurricanes? And that's what you can see by this figure here, this diagram. It looks like a, almost like a campfire with a flame heading up there at the top. And what you're seeing is that as we get from May to June, we don't normally see a whole lot of hurricane activity. But look what happens as you get towards August and then September especially, September 10th. That's what we call the peak of the hurricane season because that's the time of year when we would tend to see the most hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin. That's the time of year when much of the United States has to be most on guard for a hurricane to potentially make landfall. So that's when we're most concerned about hurricanes. And then even beyond that, as we get through October, 
and then activity starts to die down into November, and then by November 30th, December 1st, that's when hurricane season is officially over, although occasionally we can have a storm after December 1st as well. So those are uh, kind of the see how the hurricanes go through the season. Now let's get to another quick uh, poll question. And we're not actually gonna open this one up for you to vote on, but we just want you to think about this particular question. Because now we're gonna talk about the hurricane hazards that come with these storms. So I want you to think about this one in your head. What are the primary hurricane hazards that we're concerned about? Is it A, high winds, B, storm surge, C, heavy rainfall, D, dangerous surf, or E, all of the above? Which of these do you think it is? Well, the correct answer is actually all of the above. So all of these things that you see on your screen, the winds, the storm surge, the heavy rainfall, the large waves at the beach, those are all things that can happen during a hurricane. And those are all the things that we want people to be ready for when a hurricane would come to their coastline or even inland. So we have a, a good way of helping you think about this is we have a word that we've developed or we've chosen that helps you to remember each of the hazards associated with these hurricanes. And we want, the, want you to remember that word, it's called SWIFT, S-W-I-F-T. And each of these letters refers to a different hurricane hazard. So first off, we have S, which stands for storm surge. Now, storm surge is the water that comes from the ocean. So the wind from the storm pushes the ocean, the water from the ocean, onto land. A lot of areas along the coast can get flooded during a hurricane because of the storm surge. The W in SWIFT stands for wind, and that's what a lot of people think about with hurricanes, is the strong winds. And as you can see in this picture, the strong winds can cause a lot of damage, uh, especially to homes that may not be built quite as well, can cause damage to those homes. Now the I and the F are actually combined, and they stand for inland flooding. So you can get Flooding from the ocean in storm surge with the rain from a hurricane can also cause a lot of flooding, not just at the coast, but also many miles inland from the coast because that rain can pretty much fall anywhere. If you get too much rain, it has a hard time flowing away and you get areas that end up getting flooded, as you can see in this picture. And lastly, the T stands for tornadoes. So even though we often think about tornadoes, uh, the big ones that form in the mid Midwest, even for you guys that get tornadoes in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, sometimes those tornadoes can occur in hurricanes as well. So that's just one of the hazards we have to be worried about. And lastly, we don't have a letter for it, but we also wanted to touch on waves and rip currents. So these storms, because they come from the ocean, they can really make the ocean kind of angry, and the wind makes a lot of waves and rip currents. And if you go to the beach before a storm even gets there, you might not want to go in the water because the conditions aren't very safe. So remember this word, swift, because I think it'll help you remember all the different hazards that can come with a storm. Okay, so we got one more quiz question to give you guys, a little bit more interactivity here. And here it is. Which hurricane hazard of those ones we just talked about has caused the most deaths in the United States? Is it A, wind, B, storm surge, C, flooding from rainfall, or D, tornadoes? So I'm gonna pass it over to Dan, who's gonna open up the poll, and then uh, that's uh, it for me. I'm gonna pass it on to Andy, who's gonna give the rest of the talk. So thanks, Robbie. I'm watching the, uh, the polling coming in. Folks are voting. Give it another uh, 20 or 30 seconds here and see if we can get all the votes in. Okay, it looks like most everyone has voted. I'm gonna close the poll and see if I can share the results. and. Uh, for this uh, this webinar, there's a, a little bit more of a definitive answer, I think, than we've had in the past uh, couple webinars, and that is that about nearly half the people said storm surge uh, is the uh, deadliest hazard, and then about a quarter said flooding, and about another quarter, quarter said uh, tornadoes, and last with only 3% uh, was wind. So, Andy, I'll let you uh, provide the answer. 
All right, Dan, can you see my screen there? I can't yet. All right. Let me know if you need help. I can probably share mine if there it goes. Mine should be fine now. Oh, there we go. We got it. All right. Yeah, you're right, Dan. Uh, nearly half the folks voted storm surge, and that's the first time we've been doing this webinar that uh, every almost half the folks got it right. Uh, it's a very smart group here. Yes, the deadliest hazard from hurricanes actually storm surge. When I grew up, uh, I would lived a little bit inland on the west central coast of Florida. And when hurricanes got nearby, all I thought about was the wind damage that could happen. You know, what was the wind speed of the storm? What kind of damage could we see from that? The trees blew in the wind, you'd see debris flying in the air from, from storms. Um, and that's because I was away from the coast and I was in a, a higher elevation there. Um, so that's what a lot of folks think about when it comes to hurricanes before they strike. But really what people don't think about and what really should think about are the water hazards. On the top left-hand picture here, you see a lot of water rescues going on from flooding. On the bottom left, you see what we call storm surge, and that's water actually moving inland from the, from the ocean. So this is actually salt water moving inland, flooding the lower levels of these homes and this vehicle here. So the difference between the two I'm gonna talk about here in a minute. So water is what kills. Nine out of 10 people die from water, not the wind. Storm surge accounts for about half the fatalities, Flooding from rain, that's freshwater flooding, counts for about a quarter of the fatalities. And then you also have the rip currents, surf and offshore deaths from drowning. All those together are about nine out of 10 fatalities in tropical cyclones. So storm surge, I, I try to explain, this is actually water moving in from the ocean as the storm moves inland. And so we have here storm surge from Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was a very large sprawling hurricane back in 2012. It moved up to the New England area and impacted a lot of those states up there. So normally in the East Village of Manhattan on a typical day, you have folks walking around, crossing the street, vehicles driving around. Uh, Pay close attention here to this uh, shop front here. And when Hurricane Sandy made landfall, water rose up a few feet along that shop front, likely trapping the folks inside this building until the waters receded. But also look around here, this car is more than halfway underwater, this van's halfway underwater here. So there's at least a few feet of storm surge in that area alone. It was likely even worse towards the coast. And that's what this picture here is gonna tell the tale of. So let's say you go to the beach and you're in the water and you get hit by a wave. That wave can knock you over. Water's very heavy. So when a hurricane moves on shore and it brings all this water on shore, this water can shift houses off their foundations. It can move them about like little floats. And so that's how storm surge is so deadly because if folks don't evacuate, they can be trapped in their homes when these waters move through. So the difference between storm surge and flooding from rains, well, rainfall, you have rain, it falls on your roof, it goes through your gutters, it runs off into the streets. Well, when the hurricanes and tropical storms move slowly over an area, they can cause torrential rainfall. And in fact, the example I'm showing you here was from a tropical storm in 2001 in Houston, Texas. So we have a normally dry area, and when it rains excessively, the water has nowhere to go. So it tries to run off in the ditches and lakes and streams, but they become inundated. They can't handle the runoff. And so the water has to find somewhere else to go. And in this case, it found Interstate 10. So it flooded Interstate 10. And what you see here, these are semi-tractor trailers. The water's halfway up these semis. So it's at least a several feet deep of water and uh, unfortunately, Houston, Texas saw Harvey just a couple of years ago, and that also caused historic rainfall and flooding. Robbie mentioned tornadoes and water spouts. Yes, they can occur during tropical storms and hurricanes. And the difference between the two is a water spout is down here, the bottom left-hand corner is over the water. Tornadoes are over land, but they can transition. So a water spout can move, like you see in the right-hand picture, move from water to land and become a tornado. Waves and rip currents. So this is a unique hazard because you don't have to be struck or under a threat of a hurricane or tropical storm to experience waves and rip currents. A storm could be a few hundred miles offshore producing these large waves that are making it to the coast. 
And what will happen is, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner here, the wave water moves to the beach, and then the water has to recede back out before the next wave arrives. That can cause currents and water to erode a channel in the sandbar, and you can get stuck in that area, and that's what we call rip current, getting stuck in that current that gets pulled back out to sea. Now, the National Weather Service office, including the one that Danielle works at, they issue rip current statements that try to convey if there is a hazard associated with rip currents. And a lot of times when you go to the beaches, they'll have flags out to try to tell you what kind of the hazards you have in that area to try to give you a heads up because it might be blue skies, yet there's still very dangerous water conditions out there. So we talked about the hazards, but how do we predict them? How do, how do we know where a hurricane's going to go and how strong it's going to be? Well, first and foremost, what we do is we collect all these observations. And so we have observations from across land stations, from weather stations on land. Ships are providing us with data constantly. You might have cruise ships or cargo ships out there relaying observations to us. There's buoys across the oceans. We also have a lot of upper air data. So we have folks across some of the weather forecast offices in the country launch weather balloons twice a day. There's aircraft that can fly into the storm. We'll talk about more of that here in a minute. And we have satellites, very sophisticated satellites that will take images of storms from above, like you see in the bottom left-hand corner here, and they take them very frequently. And so we can see the size, shape, and possibly therefore figure out the intensity of a storm just by the picture of the storm itself. If the storm is close enough to the shore, we can see Doppler weather radar data. And so that can actually dig into the storm and you can see the structure of the storm as it moves on shore. All of this or most of this data can go into very highly sophisticated computer models that try to simulate and tell everybody where the storm's going to go and how strong it's going to be. And that's part of our job at the Hurricane Center is we try to look at all of this data. We try to look at all of the various computer model simulations and try to determine how strong and where it's going to be when it reaches a certain area. I'm going to pass it off here to Jeremy for a moment so you can describe how we fly airplanes in the hurricanes. Jeremy? Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, so I'll just kind of walk everyone through this picture here. Uh, first of all, on the left side, you have the different types of aircraft that we fly uh, into hurricanes with. And so there's two different groups uh, that are hurricane hunters. The top two planes are part of the NOAA hurricane hunters. The one on the top left is the G4, uh, that's a high altitude plane. So they typically fly uh, about 40,000 feet or so, and they they fly uh, around the perimeter of the storm and drop what's called drop signs from the plane all the way down to the sea surface. Um, and then in the top right is the P3, uh, and they have a similar mission to what we do, um, which is the plane down the bottom. Um, I'm part of the Air Force Hurricane Hunters. Uh, that's a WC-130J. And you can see both those two planes are propeller planes. Um, we we're able to fly slow uh, with this types of aircraft. Um, and we fly into their hurricanes. Um, a lot of people think that we fly, come in and fly over top of them. Well, um, we fly at about 10,000 feet and we fly right through the eye wall and into the eye. Um, so uh, with the eye wall, the picture there on the right, um, that is what's called the stadium effect. Um, for the stronger storms, uh, category three and above usually, if you can imagine yourself standing in the middle of a football field at like the 50 yard line, uh, the stadium effect is like looking all the way around you and seeing this, the stadium seating going, going up and all the way around you. And the the eye wall of a hurricane can go all the way up to about 50,000 feet, which is almost 10 miles. And we fly at about 10,000 feet. So we fly right through them. So it's very bumpy, very turbulent, um, as you would expect flying into the storm. But when you get into the actual eye, uh, it, the winds just drop into very calm and it turns into the clear blue sky like you see there. Um, so our data that we collect from the aircraft is very important, as Andy was talking about, uh, with the, the computer modeling and um, the forecasters there at the National Hurricane Center. They rely heavily on our data to help make their forecasts more accurate. 
All right, thank you, Jeremy. So inside the Hurricane Center, you're actually seeing pictures inside the operations area on the left-hand side. When a storm's approaching, uh, we have television crews that come in and interview the meteorologists there to try to get a little bit more insight to what these storms are doing and how they're behaving. So it gets very busy. We, have, In addition to television folks that show up, we have phone calls coming in to get radio interviews, new, newspaper interviews, and we also post things on social media to try to get the word out to you folks about some of the hazards that are coming. Other ways we try to get the information out through our website as well, hurricanes.gov. Now, coming up here in the next month or so, we have Hurricane Preparedness Week 2020. If you're asking questions such as, where should I get some, how, what kind of supplies should I get? What kind of evacuation area do I live in? Uh, some other hurricane preparedness items. This is a one-stop shop where you can find all this information. Weather.gov slash WRN slash hurricane dash preparedness will give you a portal to a lot of this very helpful information. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to pass it back over to Dan and John so you can field a lot of the questions you folks have been asking. And feel free to keep on asking those questions here for the next half hour. Thanks, Andy. Uh, great job, uh, everyone. And uh, I we've gotten a lot of questions. I know John and I have been uh, watching the questions here uh, come in. We've answered some. We've also highlighted a few that we want to ask our panelists. Uh, I was going to start uh, with one for uh, Danielle. Uh, this one here, I think it's a tough one, Danielle, because uh, I'm not sure that I could quite answer exactly what it's asking. Uh, it says, how many hurricanes uh, have, Nor have New Orleans had? Uh, that was from Maggie. Uh, maybe, I'm not sure that we know the exact number that we've had, but maybe you can uh, answer what you tell people in New Orleans about the hurricane threats that they get uh, in the city there. Oh, sure. So um, New Orleans has been affected by a lot of hurricanes. I don't know the number off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, I believe the return period for a hurricane is somewhere in the five to 10 year range, I think. So, um, so that's the return period. But you have to be careful when you talk about or when you think about a return period as only being hit once every five or 10 years because um, in reality, you have to prepare way more frequently than that. Uh, there's going to be close calls that you have to take action for. Um, and then in addition, um, a lot of times hurricanes comes in wa come in waves of active and inactive years. So uh, sometimes you'll have to you'll be affected several years in a row and then it'll be um, kind of quiet for a few years. So the bottom line is what we tell people is you have to prepare every year like you're going to be affected. Thanks, Danielle. I'll pass it over to John, who has uh, the next question. Yeah, sure. This one's for Jeremy. Uh, I thought this was a good one, Jeremy, and not a common one, actually. So this is from Therese. She said, have any hurricane hunters ever been hurt out of mission? Um, that's a very good question, one that we get quite often. Um, we've been actually last year we celebrated our 75th anniversary of our unit. Um, so we've been doing this for 75 years um we have had one incident uh, we had one aircraft go down in the 1970s i believe um but when you think of how how many flights we've had into hurricanes over that time that's really the only incident we've had in that entire time period so for as dangerous as the job can be um we train uh, a lot for it and we have some of the best pilots in the world so we've got a lot of experience and expertise uh, flying our aircraft and um, professionals at what we do so um, yes that we had that one incident but um, it's it's pretty safe considering uh, considering the danger of the job and uh, while I've got the floor here I wanted to introduce um, my kids Jackson and Grayson um, you guys can come in they're in second grade. They joined us on Tuesday as well, but they promised they'd have a, a new question for everyone today. And if it's, if it's too hard, I'll punt it to the panel. So <laughs> boys, what, uh, what's your question? About how many uh, hurricanes does the United, I mean, which state gets the most hurricanes in the United States every year? Which state which, gets the most hurricanes every year? Does yeah. anybody know the answer to that? Because I don't know the answer. I'll, I'll give it a shot, Jeremy. What, there's a lot of tough questions there. So what, what's your son's name? I didn't catch it, the one that asked the it's question. Jack, Jackson and Grayson. 
Jackson and Grayson, good question. So it, generally it's Florida. Uh, like when we look at most years and we take a long period of time, Florida generally gets hit the most, but every year is different, guys. Uh, but if you live in Florida, but really anywhere along the coast, along the Gulf and East Coast, you could get a hurricane, but Florida sees the most over the long period of time. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jeremy. Let us know if they have any other questions. We'll, we'll be sure to answer them. Uh, I have a question. I think I was going to send it over to both Robbie and back to Jeremy. Uh, they're, they're similar. They were asked by two different people. Uh, one was from Carson, the other is from Leanne. Uh, both, both asking basically, how long does a, a, a person have to go to school to become a meteorologist? And ask that both of a general meteorologist and also then ask that for the hurricane hunter. Uh, folks as well. So, uh, Robbie, I'll let you start, and then we can pass it over to Jeremy about the hurricane hunters. Sure. So, uh, Carson and Leah. So, at, in at a minimum, you have to go to college and for four years, and you get what's called a four-year degree. Uh, most of us get degrees in meteorology, uh, so we actually learn specifically about weather. Although there are some people in the National Weather Service that don't specifically have meteorology degrees, they might have something like physics or oceanography uh, and other science that's related to meteorology. Uh, but it, at least most people have the four-year degree. Sometimes some students will go even further than that. They'll get a master's degree or a PhD and become a doctor in meteorology. Uh, those are some of the, the most highly skilled people. They know a lot of interesting, uh, cool things about specifically hurricanes or other topics like tornadoes or winter storms. Uh, so it's really up to you how long you want to go. But at a minimum, you would have to get a four-year degree. Jeremy? for the hurricane hunters? Yeah, and I'll tag on to, to what Robbie said. Um, in addition to those uh, requirements to get into to meteorology, um, I do it in the Air Force. So um, I'm a commissioned weather officer. And uh, so you have to commission uh, via a valid source such as officer training school or the Air Force Academy or uh, reserved officer training corps, ROTC, which I did. Um, and during my four years at uh, NC State University. So um, you do that, that gets you into the career field in, um, in the Air Force. And then to be a hurricane hunter, um, there's a lot of additional training, uh, survival type training, uh, and then just the training on how to do the job in the aircraft. And that's an extra about year and a half um, before you're completely uh, qualified to, to do the mission by yourself without an instructor. Thanks, Jeremy. There's a couple follow-on questions, uh, John, that I was going to see if we could squeeze in before I pass it over to you for the next one. Um, uh, one asks, how early uh, can you start to study meteorology? And honestly, it's 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 really never too early. Uh, I think most of us on the panel, and maybe everybody can give a thumbs up if you uh, probably started with uh, a, a goal of maybe becoming a meteorologist in, in elementary or middle school. Uh, for me, it was uh, it was probably around the the fifth grade uh, time period, like uh, the folks out watching today, or I uh, got interested in weather. And by the time I was in high school, I uh, wanted to make it a career, and uh, that's what I ended up doing for college. So, again, never too early, and uh, it's never too early to start to st uh, you know working on the, that math and science because that uh, really comes into play for meteorology. And I see somebody named Brody that's saying that they're going to go get their PhD in geoscience. So that's fantastic. Uh, I know you can do it. Uh, it uh, you put your mind to it, you can do anything. So, uh, uh, John, I'll, I'll pass it over to you for uh, for the next question. Sure. I got kind of a tough one for Danielle. Sorry, Danielle. Um, this one's from Clara, and she's asking about tornadoes, but she's saying, how can you let a when a tornado is forming within a hurricane? How, how can you figure that out? <laughs> okay, that's a great question, Clara. Um, so what we do is we look at the radar data and the radar can tell us whether the raindrops are moving towards or away from the radar. And so when we see raindrops that are moving towards the radar, right next to raindrops that are moving away from the radar, we can start to sense some sort of rotation in that individual storm within the hurricane. And so that's what we're looking for when we try to look for tornadoes inside of the hurricanes, is we're looking for that signature of a storm that has both um, winds going towards and away from the radar so that we can see that rotation.
Thanks, Danielle. Um, let me see which one I was going to uh, ask next. There's one here, Robbie, and maybe throw this one to you. Uh, it it asked about, uh, if I can find it again, I don't see it, but it was about, uh, have hurricanes ever collided? Can hurricanes actually collide? Yeah, we get that question a, a lot. Uh, it's very, very hard for hurricanes to collide because what happens is the hurricane has winds around it and when the two storms come close to one another, they actually end up rotating around one another. We have a very technical term for that. We call it the Fujiwara effect. So see if you can remember that one and tell your parents about it. But essentially that's when two hurricanes get close enough that they start to move around one another. Now it's very hard when that happens for them to come together, but what can often happen is that a bigger storm can often cause the smaller storm to weaken and it almost eats it. Uh, so uh, not the technical term there, but uh, sometimes we do see that where one storm becomes the dominant hurricane and the other one just kind of vanishes and, and dissipates uh, because the other one is so much bigger or stronger. Thank you, Robbie. Um, I got a question for Andy. This one is from Seth. And Seth asks, how do the hurricanes turn? Maybe you can describe a little bit about that, Andy. Sure, John. Uh, so if we're talking about um, the turning inside of a hurricane, uh, we're talking about the Coriolis force that causes the, the differences in pressure and, and winds between the center and the, the outside environment causes the turning to occur around the center of the storm. Uh, if we're talking about the environmental flow, let's say we're talking about the motion and how they can, if heading towards a direction, they can turn and go away. Uh, that's caused by the say the cork in the stream effect. Um, the way the hurricanes are steered is by um, the environmental flow. If there's big high pressure to the north, it's going to steer the hurricane on a westward trajectory. If a cold front approaches and weakens that high, it might help turn it to the north. And if you're, you were in the harm's path at that point, it might turn away and miss you. Thanks, Andy. Um, I have a question here. I was going to send this over to Danielle. Um, it's really a question to us at NHC, but I was going to expand upon it uh, because I think uh, uh, you guys uh, uh, have the Skywarn spotter program. So someone said, like the National Weather Service has a Skywarn spotter program where people can take a class and be trained on uh, helping the weather service. But does the NAC have something similar to what the NWS has? And the, you know, the answer to that is no, that we really don't, but we are always talking with and partnering with our folks at our local National Weather Service offices. So how can someone uh, become a, a trained spotter with the, the weather service? And how do you, do you guys uh, offer those classes to train people, uh, Danielle? So, um, so yeah, so there's kind of two parts there. Uh, for the severe weather, we do have the, the spotter classes, and that kind of teaches people about what to look for and how to stay safe from severe weather. Um, we don't have, quote, spotter classes for hurricanes um, because, you know, they're, they're pretty big and we don't want people to, you know, go outside or try to look at the storm when they're being affected by a hurricane. But what we do offer, and most offices also offer, um, outreach opportunities just throughout the year. Um, we partner with different schools, different community um, organizations, and we provide um, several hurricane preparedness presentations throughout the spring and summer. Um, this year, with, uh, with all of us kind of working from home a lot, we're trying, our office at least, is trying to put together something similar to this, where we'd be able to um, offer some hurricane preparedness webinars. Um, so if you live in Southeast Louisiana, Southern Mississippi, keep an eye on our office's uh, social media and uh, website. So that's going to be weather.gov slash New Orleans or on Twitter and Facebook, we're at NWS New Orleans. Um, so keep an eye on our social media if you live in our area, and hopefully we'll have webinars similar to this for hurricane preparedness. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I got a question for Jeremy. Uh, this one's from Jackson, and he says, how long do you stay up there in the plane? How long are these missions? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, they can be as short as seven to eight hours or as long as 12 to 13 hours. Um, it just depends, a lot of it depends on how far away the storm is. So if we have to, if it takes several hours to get to the storm and back, um, I'd say on average though, it's probably about 
eight, nine, 10 hours sometimes in a storm. And we'll fly what's called um, an alpha pattern, which is like a big X across the storm. So you start in like, say the, the Northwest, you fly down to the Southeast, you do a cross leg and you come back and do it again. And we'll do that a couple of times. Thanks, Jeremy. And that was the question I was going to ask uh, John. So you stole it from me, but I found a couple other good ones here. Um, there's There's been several, and I think I'll turn this over to Robbie first and then maybe Andy, but there's been several talking about you know, how big can a hurricane get, what's the strongest, and maybe what's the costliest. So you don't have to answer all those questions, but if you want to maybe talk a little bit about uh, about hurricanes as far as uh, some of the records, biggest, strongest, and most powerful. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, let's, let's talk about the co most costly hurricanes in U.S. history. And I wanted to talk about that because the costliest hurricane is actually Hurricane Katrina. So for all you guys in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, you probably are well aware of what Hurricane Katrina did in places like the city of New Orleans or the Mississippi coast. Uh, the storm surge from that hurricane was very bad. It was very high. In fact, in the coast of Mississippi, there were some measurements that the storm surge got as high as 28 feet. Can you imagine that? How high or how tall do most of you guys stand? I mean, I know I'm about five eight, five feet eight inches. So to think that a storm surge could get 28 feet high, that's way over my head. There's no way that uh, if I was caught in something like that, that I would be able to survive it. So unfortunately, we had a lot of deaths in Hurricane Katrina, and it did end up being the the most expensive storm in U.S. history. So you know, Andy, if you have any other kind of interesting tidbits you wanted to share on Biggest, yeah, sure. strongest storms. Yeah. So I'll I'll compare it to uh, I'm from Florida, so Hurricane Andrew, you know, has a history here, especially in South Florida. Um, now, things maybe didn't cost as less back then as they did when Hurricane Katrina hit. It cost around 25 billion in damage, but it was a Category Five, but it was a compact, and so the area of damage was not as big, even though it was a technically a stronger storm. Uh, on another comparison, Hurricane Harvey that hit Texas caused I think close to five times as much cost damage, and but that was mainly from rainfall, nearly 50 inches of rain and from flooding. So it's all dependent really on the size of the storm and how the storm acts after it makes landfall. Does, does it sit there and cause heavy rainfall or not? Thanks, Andy. And Robbie. Hey, Robbie, I'm going to send this one to you. Uh, you kind of started talking about this, so I think it's appropriate and a really good question. This is from Tegan, and he says, how high does the water have to be to knock you over? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. You know what? Not very high. I think Andy mentioned this in his part when he was talking about waves, is that water is actually very heavy. You probably don't think about that very much, but if you were to hold a jug of water, it's pretty heavy, right? So think about it. if you're standing in water, and it doesn't have to be very high, maybe two, three feet high, if that water is moving around or if there's waves that are on top of that water, uh, it can push you over very easily. So actually within the National Weather Service, we put out what's called storm surge warnings. So if we think that a hurricane or a tropical storm is going to cause a storm surge of about three feet or more, we want to warn people in those areas that the water could get that high because that's about the level that we think people are most at risk. And this becomes especially true for children, because think about for people or kids that are your age or even younger, what if we have babies and toddlers? They don't even stand three feet high. So and unfortunately, if people were to get caught in that type of water, it really doesn't have to be very heavy at all. And we also see cars that get washed away in very low water levels, just because that movement of the water can pick those vehicles up. So it does not have to be very high at all. Thanks, Robbie. Um, I know we're starting to run short on time. We've got about five or six minutes left, so we'll try to get to a few more. Uh, there was one here, uh, Danielle, maybe more of a, a, well, it is a question. Um, it's from, I think, one of the parents uh, saying that uh, they homeschool their kids and would love to bring them on a tour sometime. Uh, is that possible? And maybe you don't have to give your information out now, but I think they'll be at the end. You will get uh, at least Robbie's uh, email for, for comments, so you could uh, Person could uh, email Robbie. We can get you in, in touch with Danielle. But you may have you may have an email or, or something at the office that you uh, have folks uh, send to uh, to request tours and things like that. So let's see if you can answer that. 
Yeah, so um, the most weather service offices do allow office tours. Um, obviously, right now we're not doing that um, because of the, the the virus and all that. Um, but once things quiet down, I'm sure that we will begin doing office tours again. So uh, just depending on who or which office is your your quote unquote local office, um, you would contact that local office and just let them know that you're inter interested in a tour, and hopefully they'd be able to get it set up for you. Thank Thanks, you, Danielle. Yeah. I think this is a question for everybody, so, so maybe we can kind of answer it pretty quickly. It's a little function of our age, so that's a little warning to everybody. It says, how long, this is from Tracy, how long has everyone been a meteorologist here? So maybe we could just go around the horn. We'll start with, uh, I'll say first for myself. Uh, I first got a meteorology job in 2004, so it's a little, about 16 years for me. So Robbie, you want to go next? Yep, so I'm just a little bit longer. I've got about 18 years. I started at the Hurricane Center in 2002, so uh, just a little bit longer than John. Okay, I, I was uh, shorter than you guys. Uh, I've been in the uh, weather service since 2009. That was my first official meteorology job. So um, I actually worked in the weather service while I was in graduate school, so beginning in 2005, but my first full-time job started in 2007. Jeremy, I'll let you go next. Okay. Uh, for me, I graduated about 2004, so I've been um, a meteorologist in the Air Force for about 15 years. And before I started doing this job about four years ago, but before then I was active duty Air Force, so I moved around uh, a lot, like a lot of uh, military people have to do all around the country. I lived in Arizona, um, Nebraska, California, Florida, um, North Carolina, um, before I ended up here. In Mississippi, I also did a year in Korea, so it's been a very interesting um, job doing this in the military. Yeah, I uh, I started. I might be the oldest here. I started at the Hurricane Center in uh, 1993. I was pretty young at the time, but uh, so I've been doing this for uh, over half my life now. Twenty uh, was that 27 years will be this summer. So uh, um, it's been a, it's been a quite interesting ride, and I uh, really do love working at the Hurricane Center. Uh, I did have another, I think we do have time for another question or two. I, I did see one that asked about uh, what was the most recent category five hurricane. And uh, we did have a couple of those uh, last year with Hurricane Lorenzo and then also Hurricane Dorian. But I was gonna throw it over to Jeremy because I know Jeremy, uh, you've actually flown in many of these storms, maybe not all category fives, but you have had your experience uh, uh, flying into uh, some recent category five hurricanes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you mentioned uh, Dorian, uh, Hurricane Irma uh, a couple years ago, um, Hurricane Lane out in the Pacific that threatened Hawaii a couple years ago as well. Uh, and probably the, the most memorable one was uh, Hurricane Michael in, uh, in 2018, because um, I flew the landfall mission of that storm. And um, what stood out about Michael was that it continued to strengthen right up until landfall. So we were flying that storm and seeing it strengthen, watching the pressure drop and the wind strengthen right up to landfall. So that was um, kind of heartbreaking, but very memorable as well. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I think uh, I'm going to send this question to Robbie. It's kind of forward looking here. It says, "Does this is from Teresa. She says, does the coming 2020 hurricane season look concerning with lower wind shear and higher ocean temperatures. I don't know if you want to take a shot at that, Ravi. Sure, yeah, so, you know, the, those ingredients that you just asked about, with the shear and the water temperatures, those are actually uh, two of the factors that cause or allow hurricanes to form. They like warm water, they like low wind shear. Uh, so, yeah, if those conditions were to continue into the peak of the hurricane season, then that could possibly cause more hurricanes to form. Now, I will say that for us as forecasters, and then even for you guys who live along the coast, every year should be a concern for you. You should be preparing every year as if that would be a year that you would get hit by a hurricane. We've had some hurricane seasons, uh, such as 1992, and it was kind of a long time ago, but that's the year that Hurricane Andrew hit South Florida and caused all the damage in the Miami area. And it was actually a very slow season, if you think about it. You go back and look at the records, we didn't have that many storms that year. We didn't have that many hurricanes. Yet that was the first storm of the year, it was the A storm, 
It was also the strongest storm of the year and it caused the most damage. So even in slow seasons, you can have bad landfalls. And so that's what we try to tell everybody is, don't be so concerned about the numbers. We have to watch them and just make sure that we're ready. But you too also have to be ready for even that one storm that could potentially affect your area. Thanks, Robbie. I see that it's now uh, right around uh, 11 o'clock uh, Central Time. Uh, we're running out of time here. Um, did have one quick question. I think I'll squeeze in here uh, and then we'll have to wrap things up. Uh, but it was a question asking, you know, Jeremy, it was a question asking about do we ever give uh, her airplane tours? And I'll just start with saying that, uh, yes, we uh, typically the National Weather Service partners with our local National Weather Service offices, the Air Force, uh, hurricane hunters and then the NOAA hurricane hunters to put on what we call the hurricane awareness tour that's done each uh, spring. Uh, we alternate between the East Coast, the United States and the Gulf Coast. This year it was supposed to be along the Gulf Coast, but unfortunately we're not able to have that uh, event this year. One of the stops was going to be in New Orleans, uh, but hopefully, and again, no plans have been made, but hopefully we can uh, have that tour take place again uh, next year. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll bring along the Gulf Coast since we were playing that this year. Maybe we'll do it there next year. So uh, look out for that. And I know maybe Danielle, you want to uh, say a few words because uh, you guys help organize it. And we've had some great events like that in the past. And then maybe Jeremy could talk about if there's other opportunities to tour the, the aircraft. Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, we had actually already started a lot of the planning for the hurricane awareness tour for this year when um, everything happened and it ended up having to be canceled. Um, so it's it stopped in our forecast area pr almost every other year. There's almost always a stop in uh, in our forecast area, either Baton Rouge or New Orleans. I think it's been in Gulfport once. Um, this year it was also supposed to be uh, making a stop in Jackson. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so every other year we typically do see a, a stop along the Northern Gulf Coast. Jeremy, anything yeah. to add? Yeah, and I echo that, Dan, that, that's probably the best opportunity for the public to be able to tour our airplanes is those awareness tours. Um, we also do, uh, air shows, especially during the off season. So, um, keep an eye out if you're familiar with air shows in your local area. Um, we'll come and set up a static display and have the, the public walk walk through the airplane and we'll kind of talk about each station and each uh, each job that we do. So keep an eye out for those opportunities as well. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, th and thanks, uh, John, Robbie, Danielle, and Andy. Uh, it's, uh, we have fielded a lot of great questions this morning. Uh, thanks to all of you for being very attentive and uh, asking those fantastic questions. Uh, it really makes uh, our job of doing the webinar very easy when we get such uh, great questions and a lot of engagement from you all. So I really want to uh, thank you for that. Uh, that's going to be it for this morning. Everybody may want to say a quick final goodbye and, and thanks as well. Uh, but I'm going to sign off and then I'll let John maybe pass it around and, and say goodbye. But again, thanks everyone for, your, uh, for attending this morning. Thank you, Dan. And thanks everybody for, uh, for listening to the webinar. Hopefully you enjoyed it. See everybody. Bye. 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 Have a great day.